an internationally recognized, legally assured homeland. He felt that with the settlement by itself, um, people moving to the land of Israel, if there were not uh, diplomatic efforts made at the same time that would, uh, that would bring us to, inter to bring about international recognition, uh, we also would not, um, would not succeed. Uh, and over the next few years, uh, from the first Zionist Congress, uh, once this, this, this Basel program was established, Herzl continued to work to create the institutions that would carry things forward. David, can you share some of that with us? So uh, Herzl was a polypotentialite. He knew many things. He was a lawyer, he was a journalist, he was a playwright. He also understood economics and he knew that a, to the Jewish state that he had envisioned would, would require a fiscal system, would require an economy. So one of his first ideas was to create a bank chartered under the laws of England, the Jewish Colonial Trust, and these shares were sold for one pound sterling to Jews around the world. Hundreds of thousands of, uh, of Jews became shareholders. It was a bank chartered under the laws of England that had branches that took its capital, invested in, in, uh, in towns and infrastructure in Eretz Israel. There's a little box in the middle. It's, you can't read it, but it shows that the lead director of the Jewish Colonial Trust was Theodore Herzl himself, as if he wasn't busy enough, he also sat on the board. And the Jewish Colonial Trust ultimately became the, uh, the National Bank of Israel after independence until the Bank of Israel was established, and it exists to this day as the Bank, uh, bank Lumi. Further, at the Fifth Sinus Congress, the Karen Kayem at Israel, the Jewish National Fund, was established to buy land and uh, to create that infrastructure, uh, dunam by dunam, planting trees, and that still exists, of course, the Karen Kayama to this day. Uh, David, what did Herzl feel about uh, the results of that first Congress? Right, even before he had these institutions up and operating, he concluded the conference confident that, uh, that they would come into being and that his idea would be realized. And he wrote at the end of the conference, in Basel, I founded the Jewish state. David, there are those that ask me if, uh, if indeed those were really words that he wrote or if it's, if it's a myth. Anything you have that you can share with us? So the, the picture in front of you on the slide is, a, is really a, an excerpt out of this book. This is a version of Herzl's diary that was published in Berlin in 1922. And that segment is here where the sticky is. Interesting, we talk about Herzl's concern about anti-Semitism. This particular book, as I said, was uh, printed in Berlin. It was plundered by the Nazis. And the reason I know that is there's a stamp in it that says it's from the archival depot of Offenbach, which is the US soldiers when they tried to reassemble all the plundered goods from the Jewish communities had a book depot with millions and millions of books. This was one of them. And yes, it's indeed, it's true. That was a precise quote from Herzl. So what happens next, David? Okay, uh, Herzl didn't have much time left. He didn't, he wasn't aware of it at the time of the first Zionist Congress, but he only had seven more years to live. He died prematurely at the very young age of 44 in uh, 1904, but he spent those seven years in an in a, a amazing, um, a series of diplomatic efforts traveling all over the world, uh, mostly by train, uh, uh, going from one capital to another, from one diplomat to another, trying to get recognition for the idea of a Jewish state. Uh, he was first working with the uh, Turkish Sultan. Uh, the Palestine at that point was under the rule of the Ottoman Empire. He reached an impasse. And he turned to the British instead, had a meeting with Lord Chamberlain, who is the secretary for, for colonialism at, at that point, colonialism of a different sort than the way we, we refer it to today. Uh, he got some initial agreement about the idea of settling the Jews in El Arish in the Sinai. Uh, later on, of course, the possibility of settling the Jews in, in, in Uganda. Uh, Herzl would not live to see the fruition of any of his efforts on the diplomatic front. 
uh, but uh, the, the process that he set in motion, uh, indeed, uh, 20 years after the first Congress would have its impact. What have we got up here on the screen, David? So what this is, is the Balfour Declaration, which was issued by the British Parliament in November of 1917. This particular item is an old fashioned Machberet workbook from the 1920s. And as you see on the screen, Herzl's picture um, on the front and on the back, the text of the Balfour Declaration itself. And you mentioned that, that Herzl cultivated a relationship with the British. We talked about the Zionist Congresses. The first three were held in Basel, but the fourth one Herzl purposely had uh, scheduled to be in London, England. This is a ribbon from the and a medal from the fourth Zionist Congress held in London, and he held it in London on purpose because he knew the Ottoman Empire was in its last legs and he wanted to cultivate the relationships, which ultimately was the, pre the beginning of the process to give rise to the Balfour Declaration. Rabbi Wernick, if we can move to the next slide, and David, why don't you share with us a little known element of the Balfour Declaration itself? Okay, thank you. Be before going taking a look at the text, I'll also mention that the Balfour Rec uh, Declaration was followed three years later, and we just celebrated a couple of days ago the 100th anniversary of the San Remo Conference, at which uh, many states uh, uh, throughout well, Europe uh, It's the last portion endorsed. of what you can read on the right-hand page. Sorry? Okay. Uh, so the San Remo conference was a further diplomatic uh, achievement uh, that followed on the footsteps of what Herzl had set in motion. In terms of the text, we usually refer to the Balfour Declaration uh, with great uh, pride in that this is what uh, uh, established the legal in the first legally international recognition of the right of the Jewish people to, to return to their homeland. And indeed that's part of the text. But we often stop at that point and don't continue reading the next line, which states, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Uh, it's important for you to mention that for, for two reasons. One, it certainly shows an awareness that there were Arabs living there, that there weren't others other than the Zionists already living in, in, in Palestine, something that Herzl too was very much aware of, and we'll come to that, to that shortly. Uh, but I also mention it because it's reflective of Herzl's own vision uh, of a society, of a new society that would, uh, would, uh, would arise in the land of Israel that would indeed be this Jewish state that he, that he, that he so much uh, dreamt of but one that would welcome as equals uh, all people uh, and not just, not just Jews. Uh, at one point uh, in his, uh, in, in, well, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll return to that as well, but they, uh, I, the, I think it is important to keep in mind that this Balfour Declaration had both elements in it. Um, so as this, as this state was Balfour Declaration or not, as the Jewish state, uh, the Jewish state was already coming into being long before the Balfour Declaration itself was, was issued. Uh, the Zionists didn't wait around for this international recognition. David, can you share, show us uh, something along those lines? So in the next slide, the, the building of the land began. What you have here, believe it or not, is Tel Aviv. Um, Tel Aviv was founded in 1909. This is uh, the main street in Tel Aviv at the end of this slide. Uh, at the end of this picture, you see the Gymnasia, the Herzliya Gymnasia, the first Hebrew-speaking school established in Eretz Israel, and you see donkeys carrying things on the streets of Tel Aviv. Now, Herzl in 1902 wrote a book called Ob Neuland, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But this book that I'm holding up, it's hard to see, but this is the Hebrew translation of Ob Neuland, and it was translated by Nachum Sokolov into Hebrew in 1902. The name of the book was Tel Aviv, the fabulous city of Tel Aviv, which is hosting great celebrations for Yom Hatzmut today, is named after Herzl's book. So this 
was the the continuation of ongoing building and in, investing and establishment of the Jewish community. David, thanks. Just to explain how Tel how the uh, uh, Tel Aviv got its name that David that David mentioned. Uh, the book that Herzl wrote in German was Alt Neuland, Alt meaning old, Neu, new, and Tel is an archaeological phenomenon that represents the, the ancient. Aviv, of course, represents the spring of things, uh, new things blossoming and coming into being, and indeed it was the poetic translation that Nachum Sokolov chose uh, to embrace the, uh, the idea of, of, of Alt Neuland. Uh, and although Herzl did not get to live to, to see it come into being. Uh, one re when one reads Out in Neuland, it's, it, it's, it's just amazing okay. to what extent he imagined what would actually come about. Uh, just one short quote here from, from the book, one example of so many describing this amazing country that, uh, that he envisioned. A magnificent city had been built besides the sapphire blue Mediterranean. The magnificent stone dam showed the harbor for what it was, the safest and most convenient port in the Eastern Mediterranean. Never in histories were cities built so quickly or so well, long before we became the startup nation that uh, Rabbi Wernick mentioned uh, in his introduction. Uh, Herzl really envisioned uh, the Jewish people uh, returning to the land, developing technology. Uh, he was a big fan of technology. Uh, and he imagined us taking all of that and turning it into uh, very sustainable cities with a great concern for environmentalism even before the term existed. Uh, he had parks and green areas and so on and so forth. Uh, and, he, and again, although he didn't uh, see it, uh, he saw see it for in, in reality, he certainly saw it in his, in his mind's eye. Uh, but doing all of this was going to take money. David. Next slide. Next slide. There we go. David, are you on? I am. am I so. Yeah, so what you have here is the Karen Heisod, which was one of the institutions of the Jewish community related to the Jewish agency to help fund the establishment of uh, the Jewish community and the fulfillment of Herzl's dream. This is a certificate from the 1920s. It has Herzl's, Herzl on it, of course, is the quote, Imesh kachach Yerushalayim, tishkach yemini, if I forget, you Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its cunning. And this is called a sacrifice on on helping to build the national homeland. You won't get your money back, but your payment will be satisfaction for your role in Herzl's dream to come. Okay. Uh, next slide. We're supposed to be seeing up there a poster that says Im Tietzu Enzu Agada, which is uh, uh, Herzl's famous slogan that if you will it, it is no dream. Uh, and certainly what we've heard so far indicates that that was uh, indeed the case. But in addition to not living to see the wonders of Tel Aviv and of the Jewish state as a whole that came into being, there was another phenomenon that Herzl also predicted, which he didn't get to see. And that was indeed the, um, the, the, the Holocaust, which uh, uh, was so devastating. Can we see that next slide? Already back in 1902, when he wrote his book, Out Neuland, uh, he staged a dinner party around the table of some very wealthy uh, Jews living in Vienna at the time. And uh, their conversation turned from theater and from sports to the problem of anti-Semitism. 
And some of the things that are written here are just amazing to me. Again, 1902, uh, when the, uh, our people are in peril, when the Germans are in a bad mood, they break Jewish windows. When the Czechs are out of sorts, they break into Jewish homes. And then one of the hosts of the dinner party says, I feel it coming. We'll all have to wear the yellow badge. This was 40 years, of course, before the Holocaust. Or emigrate, said the rabbi. I ask you where to, asked Walter. Are things better anywhere else? Even in free France, the anti-Semites have the upper hand. Uh, but with whatever he imagined might come into being, he, he couldn't even in his worst nightmares have known that his daughter Trudy would find her death in the Theresienstadt uh, concentration camp. But with the Holocaust aside, uh, nothing stopped the Zionist movement. The Zionist movement continued to be active throughout World War II. Uh, and immediately at the end of the war, David, show us what happened. There was a 22nd Zionist Congress was held in Basel um, in 1946. The 21st Congress was held in of literally days before the outbreak of World War II. And then the remnants of the Jewish community and the Zionists got together in Basel in 1946. And like in prior Congresses, there was a delicate card. And the first order of business essentially was to see who made it and who didn't make it. This was the, the continuation of the discussion and, and the, the work towards creating a national, the Eretz Medinat Yisrael, what became Medinat Yisrael. At the same time, there were remnants of the Jewish uh, community living in displaced persons camp in Europe, and they needed and wanted to go home. They wanted to go to Eretz Yisrael. And so there was an initiative to bring illegal immigrants to Palestine and to run the blockades by, of the British. Next slide, please. Uh, what you will see is this picture. This is the uh, illegal immigrant ship the aptly named the Theodore Herzl. This was, uh, we, it became evident that Herzl was right. Life uh, for the Jewish people in Europe was on borrowed time and the time had, had run out and the Jewish people needed a place to go. And Herzl was an apt name for a ship bringing the illegal immigrants home. Uh, David, what happened next in our history? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, with the ship itself, we're now 73 years and one week, two weeks from the anniversary of the Herzl ship having been uh, uh, commandeered, intercepted by the British. It was on the 13th of April, 1947. 2,641 passengers on board, uh, heavy resistance resulting in three of them being killed and 27 injured. Uh, but their plight and the plight of so many others who tried to make it into Palestine uh, further to uh, World War II really did have its impact. Uh, David, you can show us uh, what was going on in the international arena. So with the need to find a solution for the, the uh, survivors of the Holocaust in displaced persons camps and the um, fighting by the Yeshuv against the British to open the gates to Palestine. The, Uni the United Nations was asked to come up with a solution. The British who had the British mandate, which was the successor to the Balfour Declaration put in place at the San Remo conference, the, 100th anniversary of which we celebrated uh, on April 26 over the weekend. The British threw their hands up, kicked it back to the United Nations, tell us what to do. So they created a special committee on Palestine who developed this report after coming to, the, to Palestine and interviewing Jews, Jewish and Arab representatives. And the solution reflected in this report is the partition resolution the partition plan, which was to create a Jewish and Arab state in Palestine with Jerusalem as an international city, which then went to a vote of the United Nations on November 29th, 1947. 
Um, and obviously this was a momentous and joyous occasion for the Jewish community, but uh, David, not universally accepted by our neighbors there. No, um, certainly not. And first of all, let's mention uh, when Herzl said in Basel, I created, I founded the Jewish state. Uh, he went on to say that if I said it out loud today, uh, it would be met with universal last laughter. But in five years, certainly in 50 years, the whole world will know that it's true. And sure enough, exactly 50 years after that conference, uh, the partition plan was, was adopted by the United Nations. But as David said, not universally accepted, far from it, uh, which brings us really to the third thing that Herzl was wrong about. The first was that anti-Semitism would end with the Zionist movement. The second was that Hebrew would never be revived. The third was that the Arabs would welcome us here in Palestine. He was very well aware that there were, that there were Arabs living here. Uh, but as I mentioned before, he was very inclusive. He wanted a just society in which all would be equal to the point of which that in his novel, he even has in his imaginary government, he has an Arab minister who when queried by some who thought it was strange that the Arabs would welcome him, this Arab minister says, the Jews have enriched us. Why should we be angry with them? They dwell among us like brothers. Why should we not love them? Uh, and at another point in his novel, he says, uh, he has one of his characters say, my associates and I make no distinction between one man and another. We do not ask to what race or religion a man belongs. If he is a mensch, and he wrote this in Hebrew, if he is a mensch, that is enough for us. Uh, but despite the resistance, and we know that the resistance was severe and that it continues today, uh, the government of the state in the making led by David Ben-Gurion, decided to go ahead and declare the Jewish state. Uh, David, you started out by an, an invitation to the Zionist Congress. Have you got another invitation to show us? I do, and this is what we're celebrating uh, that happened 72 years ago today in the Jewish calendar. The most momentous occasion in Jewish history for 2000 years, the in 2000 years was the de Declaration of Israel's independence and look at the simplicity of the invitation that went out to the, the approximately 200 people who were invited to the museum in Tel Aviv for the Declaration of Independence ceremony. The British mandate uh, uh, under the UN partition resolution was to end in six months. And so th the British decided as a shtoch to leave on a Saturday. So the Declaration of Independence had to take place on a Friday. It took place at four o'clock. And you'll see in this invitation, which is the prize jewel in my collection, that you're invited to come to hear the declaration. Please keep this a secret and recommended wardrobe, light festive clothing. And this was um, the Declaration of Independence, May 14th, 1948 the fulfillment and the, the, the fulfillment of Pearl's dream 50 years and eight months or so after he wrote, in 50 years, people will know that I was right. Uh, the uh, next slide, please. This is the famous photograph of David Ben-Gurion reading the Declaration of Independence at that ceremony. Uh, it is, it is on a record, you, um, and for the young people who are watching, you can ask your parents what a record is, but this was uh, the photograph is uh, Ben-Gurion under Herzl's picture. David Ben-Gurion asked that this ceremony be designed, and he retained Otto Wallisch, a prominent graphic artist, to design the ceremony and symbolically and appropriately put Herzl's picture front and center. And uh, interestingly, uh, David Ben-Gurion instructed all the delegates not to bring any food. There should be no food or drink on the table. This is a historic event, though I see in this photograph, it looks like there may be an orange in front of the person to the right of David Ben-Gurion. But this is the uh, great historic event, which we are celebrating today, David. Yeah, it's a shame there's no Barakas there. We're used to seeing that in meetings of the government today, but uh, I guess Ben-Gurion had it right. Uh, in any case, that secret invitation that you mentioned that was sent out 
outside of the Mossad, apparently Israelis aren't very good at keeping secrets. And although the invitation was only officially sent to a couple of dozen people, <laughs> there were hundreds, if not thousands, who assembled outside of the, of the museum uh, to, to celebrate that. Uh, I guess not only not secrets weren't uh, being kept at that time, but social distancing was also not yet in fashion. Uh, but as you mentioned, uh, uh, Herzl being uh, center stage there was indeed very symbolic, not just in terms of being the figure he was, but also in terms of the, the ideology. Uh, let's see the, the, next, the, next, the next slide. The Declaration of Independence itself that was, uh, uh, that was uh, uh, approved at that, uh, at that gathering uh, stated um, that the state of Israel will promote the development of the country for the benefit of all its inhabitants and uphold the full social and, po and uphold full social and political equality of all its citizens without distinction of race, creed, or sex. Uh, again, following very much on, on Herzl's I ideals uh, from 50 years earlier. I, in this particular page of the, the newspaper that was published in, in the, uh, on the occasion of, of the Declaration of Independence, I note two things in particular. One, it's not a picture of David Ben-Gurion up there on the right top hand corner. It's a picture of Herzl, uh, which is not, again, not to be taken for granted. We know how much politicians want themselves to be front and center, but here the honor was given to Herzl. And the other thing is the headline there in Hebrew reads, Ha'am machiz al medinat Yisrael, the people, the nation declare the state of Israel. Uh, from its very beginning, Zionism was conceived of as belonging to the entirety of the Jewish people. Uh, and that's something that, is, uh, that remains with us today. Uh, it really was seen as something belonging to all of us. Uh, David, you've got a poster as well, I understand, that uh, illustrates that. Next slide. So the, uh, before going to that, Herzl maintained his connection to the current uh, government and con current uh, Knesset historically. This is a picture when Chaim Weizmann, the first president of Israel was inaugurated. His, he was inaugurated in front of a picture of Herzl. So the state of Israel was from its establishment, from before its establishment and to this day, a joint project of the Jewish people from around the world, those living in Israel and those of us living outside of Israel. And you have both aspects of it on this call between the two Davids. This is a, um, an advertisement for the United Jewish Appeal Campaign in the United States in New York uh, in 1947, 1948, talking about the uh, partition resolution in November, 1947 and the need to raise a whopping amount of money in order to help to bring the displaced person to build is this was as you can see to to decide the destiny of a whole people and the whole people were not just the Jews living in Israel but all of us together david and indeed that remains uh, as far as uh... I see it, Zionism remains a project of the entirety of the Jewish people uh, with its uh, moral and ideological foundations as well. One of the very last things that Herzl wrote, if we could see on the next slide, he published this just a few months before his death in a Zionist newspaper for Jewish youth uh, in Europe. Uh, and he said, I truly believe that even after we possess our land, Zionism will not cease to be an ideal. Uh, it wasn't just a matter of coming back to the land itself, but also he writes the yearning for ethical and spiritual fulfillment. And I think this is very important because if we're going to continue asking the entirety of the Jewish people to join us in this enterprise, they have to know that there's an ideal, as it says here, an, an, an infinite, endless ideal uh, that continues to draw us. Uh, and if we could uh, skip to, to two slides now, we're running short on time, so we'll leave that out. Um, this is very much reflected in what is now referred to as the Jerusalem program. We started this presentation by talking about the Basel program, which was very practically oriented 
uh, in terms of putting in process the uh, the machinery that would that was necessary to create the Jewish state. Uh, several years ago, uh, we we revised the Basel program. Uh, it's now known as the Jerusalem program. It was adopted in 2004, uh, and it was it's really what's become the official definition of Zionism today, adopted by the World Zionist Organization, uh, and it very much reflects Herzl's vision. Uh, that was intentional. I can tell you as one of the people involved in drafting this Jerusalem program, uh, Herzl was uh, just as he is right now looking over my shoulder. Uh, he's always there looking over my shoulder and he was where we were drafting this as, as well. Uh, and it calls for strengthening Israel as an exemplary society with a unique moral and spiritual character marked by mutual respect for the multifaceted Jewish people rooted in the vision of the prophets striving for peace and contributing to the betterment of the world in Hebrew that is referred to as Ikun Olam. Uh, and this to me really remains, it's, it's Herzl's legacy. Uh, and as I said in the beginning, it's his vision, it's our challenge today. Uh, and it's taking that challenge along with the hope that's rung eternal with the Zionist movement uh, that continues to motivate me and I hope motivates all of us. David, you want to share with us a last word on the Hatikva? Sure. It, it all began, it began with an idea. Herzl had an idea that the future for the Jewish people could be better than it is today. And that if you unleashed uh, Jewish creativity in our own land where we were safe and secure, amazing things would happen. And that's indeed what happened. So in front of you are uh, a number of uh, versions of the Hatikva, the, the Zionist anthem, which of course became the national anthem of the state of Israel. And here is a, re is, is a record of an old Vitrola uh, with a, a version from Ephraim Zimbalist. It was really about hope, our, our hope for a better future. And that hope remains be because uh, there will always be challenges. Today we have medical challenges in Israel and here and all and around the world, there'll be political challenges, security challenges. But what we've seen is the strength of Herzl's idea and the strength and the cooperation of Jewish people around the world will help to keep Herzl's hope and his dream alive. Last words that, for you, David. Yeah, and that that for me is really the uh, the 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 double meaning or the dual meaning of uh, of Yom Ma'ut for us today. On the one hand, to take tremendous pride in the absolutely unbelievable accomplishments of, the, uh, of Israel, of the Zionist movement, against all odds, what we've been able to, to, to do here. And yet keeping in mind Herzl's uh, moral dictate to us, knowing that there is still a tremendous amount more to do. Uh, and if Herzl were here with us today, I strongly believe he would uh, feel both of those things himself, amazed, but not surprised, by what we've done, he believed it would happen, uh, but at the same time, he would be telling us, don't rest on your laurels. There's a great deal more to do. Go ahead and do it. Uh, and what we're going to end with, having mentioned Hatikva, uh, you all know that we in Israel are uh, locked down. The, uh, there's a curfew that's been in effect for the last uh, 24 hours, ending in just another, uh, ending in just another few minutes. Uh, but in the meantime, Israelis have taken to their porches, to their balconies, just as Herzl, the famous pose of Herzl on his balcony, so perhaps it's appropriate. Uh, and we have here a rendition of Hatikva that I think is most appropriate for us to end this presentation with. So, so Thank so you David, all for sharing this with us. Steve? David and David, we're going to hold this for the very last conclusion of our session. Um, we want to invite people, <clears throat> excuse me, people that are joining us via Zoom or on Facebook Live or through our YouTube channel uh, to ask questions at this time. We have a few moments for questions. Um, please do so through the chat or the comment um, sections. We have operators standing by um, to uh, forward um, the uh, questions um, to us. Uh, some of which have been asked and answered already as part of your presentation. Um, we want to thank the two of you um, really for such a, a wonderful um, journey um, through um, 
uh, through uh, uh, Herzl's uh, vision. And we also wanna take uh, a moment to uh, share our special thanks uh, to all of the partners, uh, the American Zionist Movement, Camp Ramon Canada, Canadian Zionist Federation, uh, the Jewish Agency for Israel celebrating its uh, 90th, 90th year, uh, Merkaz, um, uh, which is the, um, the movement, the con conservative movement's um, party to the World Zionist Congress. Um, I um, am privileged to be one of the delegates to that and to work with you, David, and with other leaders from Toronto, Canada, and around the world um, on these Zionist ideas through the WZO and the Jewish Agency. We wanna thank the Masorti movement, uh, and we want to thank Robin's Hebrew Academy, our partner here at Beth uh, and one of uh, the, the leading day schools in the GTA, Tenebem Chat, um, who's partnered with us, um, the Community High School, uh, the WZO, of course, and our partner, the UJ Federation of Greater Toronto. Um, any uh, questions um, that we have? I am not seeing any questions being asked. And let me just check with some of our, our staff here. Linda, do we have any questions from Facebook or YouTube? Uh, not seeing any questions. Um, again, our special thanks to David Breakstone and David Matlow, uh, the Davids, um, for a wonderful presentation of Herzl in 2020. And we'll conclude um, with really this, my daughter made Aliyah in May. So she's coming up on the one year of her Aliyah and little did she think that as she was making Aliyah that um, this would be the circumstance of the virus. Uh, but she too um, participated with Israelis throughout the country, um, getting on their balconies um, and singing Hatikva. Um, this is the national anthem. If you're able to stand, um, I invite you to do so as we conclude with this beautifully inspiring rendition of Hatikva. Thank you everyone. Yom Hatzma'ut Sameach. Stay, stay safe, stay healthy, stay sane, stay home. Um, and we hope uh, that God willing, uh, this uh, uh, virus or the, the circumstance of the virus um, will pass such that we can uh, in our day um, re, uh, uh, re meet. Um, in a more intimate social settings um, and not like this. But in the, but in the interim, um, thank God we have the ability uh, to continue uh, to get together um, and to celebrate as a people. Um, again, our thanks to the Davids um, and we wish everybody a pleasant day and a good week and a Shabbat Shalom. Be sure to join us at All Access Beth Sedek. You can find out our programming from our website, www.bethsedek.org. Uh, we continue to offer minion morning and evening 
Uh, we drop a Kabbalat Shabbat at 6 p.m., which will be live this year. Will be This week will be our Shabbat on the floor um, um, team that will be presenting a very freilich Kabbalat Shabbat. Um, we are not um, uh, live streaming on um, Shabbat or Yom Tov, although that is something that is under discussion. Um, and we'll let you know about that in the near future. Uh, on Mondays, we have conversations over coffee. Uh, this week's guest will be Neshama Karlibach, um, uh, the daughter of, uh, of Reb Shlomo Karlibach, uh, a, a, someone who's familiar to Toronto, but also one of the leaders of, uh, of Jewish um, music and uh, spiritual revival in terms of Jewish music. Uh, we invite you to uh, participate as often as you can um, with the many different ways that we have um, to, <clears throat> though we remain physically distant, um, to work towards being spiritually near. Um, again, thank you. And Yom Hatzmut Sameach. Bye bye. And next year in Jerusalem. Amen. Next year in Jerusalem. <laughs>